It's day 84 and we're going to look at using REPLDB to store persistently information that we want to be stored and changed by our users. So you remember last time we used REPLDB, people were scratching their heads a little bit and going, I like it, it solves a lot of the problems with opening and saving files and messing around, but if every user gets their own database, how can I build something multiplayer? How can I build something that more than one person can work on at the same time? And you may remember me mentioning very casually, as if I were the biggest brain person in the world, you need a client server model. Well, that's what this is. When you build a web server, you are running your code in one place in a REPL. Anybody accessing your website via its URL, via its website address, is going to be the client. They're going to be accessing content from your server and talking to it. This means that anything you store in REPLDB is accessible to everyone that comes to your site because there's one database certainly and it's being used by your web server and your web server is using web pages to talk to all the different people at the same time so we have the opportunity here of storing anything that could be stored in a list in a dictionary or just as a variable in REPL DB and have persistent offline storage and the ability to change things we're going to start by taking this program, which is a simple login program, and adapting it to use REPLDB. Let's take a quick look at the program to see how it's working. Well, I've bought in request and redirect, and I've got a static path storing my images. I've then got a dictionary that I've put in code to store the usernames of two of my users. I've got a login method via post that checks that their username and password are correct for my users. If they're good, I'm redirecting them to the page forward slash yup. If they're not, I'm going to re redirect them to forward slash nope. And this is a nice little thing to do because that means you only have to build one page with an error message on instead of typing it out multiple times. Our nope is just an image, our yes is just an image, and our login page is opening a login form that I've built as a separate HTML page. And here it is in action. If I put in some rubbish and try and log in, then I ain't getting in there. If I put in a username that I know works and a password I know works, then great, I get in there too. So the system all works, but the problem and the limitation is that I've hard coded the dictionary. Let's see if we can do something about that. Well, let's pull up our REPL database. Now remember, it works exactly the same way because we're still in Python. So at the top, I'm gonna go up and import my database. Instead of using users, what I'm going to do is actually set database values. Now, remember, this only needs to happen once. So I'm going to set the values and then I'm going to comment the stuff out. So I don't need to do this, but I do need to change these to DB in both cases. If I stop and run, that gets added to the database. I know this happens because in a moment, the key value on the left hand side will increase to show that it's stored two keys. I'm going to comment those out in case I need them again. And I'm going to change my other code to instead of accessing the users dictionary to access the database. And that's just a simple case of changing users for DB wherever I see it. And it's only in one place. I'm going to stop and I'm going to run. And we should be able to run it in the same way as before. So some nonsense means I don't get in. A known good username and password allows me in. Now, because this is stored in REPLDB, I also get the option for users to change things. So let's do that. I'm going to make a very quick form that would allow users to change their password. So that's a very simple form with only one password field. Now, that's not great practice. Asking the user to type in their password once is a minefield because it's very easy to mistype a password if you're putting it in once. The reason most pages ask for it twice is because they can check to see if you've typed them the same way and that reduces spelling errors in your own password. Back over on main, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add to the yes page instead of just the graphic, I'm also gonna add the form now. And I'm gonna do that by stealing some code from here. I'm going to take that and place that in the initial page. And I'm going to do plus equals to page so that it adds the code to the bottom rather than messing around with it. It's not login, it is going to be change.html. If I stop that and reload it, when I log in, I should see that and just below my new password page. I haven't put a button on, I'll go do that. And we've got our form with our new password box and our change button. Now, 
What we need to do is write some code that's going to update that. So let's write the app route for the change page. So I've added this form. This form is very simple. It's going to take in the username and the new password, and it's going to send that to a page called forward slash change pass. I'm taking the username in again because I haven't actually got the username stored anywhere at the moment. So I'm going to have to pass that on, but it's quite good practice to take in multiple forms of identification. If you are going to change something as important as a user's password anyway, in the main file, I've added this definition for change pass and I've changed the yes page that automatically opens the form and sticks it at the bottom. We'll see that in a moment. The change pass method is very, very simple. It's going to pick up the form. It's going to set the database value for that username and that password to being the new value. And then we're going to print that out on the screen. And again, these aren't good security practices. We don't print people's passwords out on the screen if we can help it. I'm only doing this to show you that it's changed. So, if I log in with a known good username like Katie and her password is K8T, then I get my ability to change my password at the bottom. I'm going to update the password to something a bit more secure than K8T. You'll see what it is in a moment. And if I click change there on the database, she's updated her password to password123. If I try again now, her old password does not work because we've changed it, but her new password works a treat and I can change it back to whatever I needed to after that. So again, you can use RepletDB in all the same ways we were using it before. You can use it to store, change, and even hunt for particular pieces of data. You can store dictionaries in them, you can store lists in them, or you can just store individual variables. Remember, there is a limit of 5,000 database records, so keep that in mind as you're building. If you have any plans to have more than 5,000 users, you may need to use a different database solution, but it's certainly very good for any startup businesses. It's a nice, easy way of getting things up and running and certainly okay for most personal projects. In fact, most of the stuff we build internally at Replit, we do tend to use Replit DB for because it's good for the vast majority of the things you might want. The most common problem is the same as it ever would be in a normal Python file. That is trying to access a key that doesn't exist. And the problem we get is that when you get that error, it's pushed out into the console amongst a load of rubbish. And the best that you're going to get is an error on the website that's, that complains about a proxy problem. I'll do this very quickly by changing my change password form to look for something else. I'm going to look for the database entry test instead. We'll see this error in action as I try to change my password. So I'm Katie. My password now is password123. I want to change it back to K8T. Oh, an internal server error. Not ever a good page to see. You'll see here in the error lots and lots of stuff, but it basically boils down to the fact that this key in the database doesn't exist. So you've got to be very careful. That's where try and accept comes in really, really handy. Trying to find something with a key, and if it's not there, catching the error and doing something different instead. As ever, I've broken some code, so go and find it and fix it. I mean, it's very, very likely to be a key error, so you know what to look for. Your big challenge for today is this. I want you to build a Flask website with a sign-up form that's going to ask for your name, your username, and your password. It's going to create a user account and then kick you to the login form. The login form should take user account details, check they're valid, and log them in. If they work, you should display hello and the person's name on the screen. This is a great test of how RepletDB can be used to incorporate the ability to create accounts into any site. A really, really important thing that you're going to need. But anything you need to store now, you can store in a dictionary inside a key value for that user, which is brilliant. Don't forget to publish it in our community and share it with the hashtag Replit 100 Days of Code when you're confident enough to share it on social media. Now, of course, Every single page should have a check to make sure that user is actually logged in. And this is quite difficult to achieve without one extra part. And that part is sessions. That's what we're going to look at tomorrow, which is why I spent all that time explaining. It's day 84. You know, you've got to have the format by now. I, I sort of build up to it. Yeah, see you tomorrow.